Hey everyone, Billy Hollis here. Today, I'd like to talk to you about durable principles for designing user experiences. Many design principles are based in how we see and how we think, and that means they don't change much. Learn them once, and they will serve you for the rest of your career. For those who don't know me, I've been writing code since the 1970s and started diving deeply into UX design about 12 years ago, and I've learned a lot of lessons. One important theme is that in all design, we're guided by principles and practices. They tell us what is likely to be good design or bad design. Here's a simple example. Crowded is usually bad, whereas open is usually good. Something that looks clean comes across to the user better and helps them do their job more effectively. Some guiding ideas or best practices, whatever you want to call them in design are transient. For example, some are driven by technology and its limitations at any time. Here's an example from the 1990s with 16 colors in the UI. Now you probably see this and think how primitive and ugly it looks and how much the design could be improved with modern techniques. But what you might not realize is that the first color monitors could only show 16 colors. It was just a matter of limited memory at that time. Then we got more colors as the hardware got better and the, and the software technology got better. This Windows form screen from about 2002 uses subtle grays and tans instead of garish colors. But we didn't use gradients because the hardware at that time didn't have good enough performance for gradients. Gradients were mostly reserved for graphics programs, producing things to be printed. And even after we got high performance gradients, it took a while to figure out designs that use them effectively. I would summarize what we've learned about gradients in design is this. The best gradients are the ones that the user does not even notice. Remember that first screen with the sticky notes on the right? What color were those sticky notes? as you remember it. Well, they are a gradient, it turns out. They're not yellow, which may be what you thought uh, when I first asked the question. The gradient mimics natural lighting in the real world, so our eyes just think it's a normal sticky note. Now, as you start looking at the screen, you'll see gradients everywhere. But good design means gradients are not garish or in your face. They just blend into the overall look of the screen to make it feel natural. And this was something we learned in the course of the developing power of our hardware and software. Now let's look at an example where we're lagging right now. Our UI technologies support layering and opacity, but I find that they are rarely used. That is, designers simply don't include those capabilities in their mental model for new designs. That's too bad because layering can be quite powerful. Here's a proof of concept that I wrote recently. So here you see that we've got some data that needs to be compared. And when you look side to side, it's not really obvious where the differences are. But if we use layering and, and translucency, we can allow the data to be overlaid in such a way that the differences become much clearer and much, much easier to see. Those of us who work with these technologies that allow layering and opacity are having to learn new techniques and new principles of design for how to use them effectively. During your career, you're going to see technology change so much that something you learned as acceptable or even best practice in 2020 will look hopelessly obsolete and be replaced with something quite different by, say, 2050. Holographic UI will likely be common by then. And we're in the process now of creating guiding principles for that. Gesture and brainwaves and other sorts of UI will probably be common by then, and they will also change design practices. Other practices are influenced by trends, fads, styles. Uh, about eight years ago, the look of very flat design became trendy. It got started because some designers were trying to prepare for smaller screens with less color depth, like cars and watches. But it just became a trend and it lasted through the introduction of Windows 10 in 2016. It's now fading away. The extra signals of color and depth are useful to help the UI communicate with the user. Here's an example from the Maps icon in Windows 10. So a lot of things are going to change during your career, but some things will change only a little or not at all. The example I mentioned earlier about crowded versus uncluttered screens is one example. 
The preference for clean and uncluttered design is based on the human visual and cognitive systems and therefore does not change on the time scale of, of human lives. So why did we ever have crowded screens like this in the first place? I mean, this probably reminds you of views in your own applications or other applications that you've worked with in the past. Well, that design trend of crowded screens started in the days of character-based displays. When all you have is 24 lines of 80 characters showing useful data meant crowded screens. Only in the past few years have we started to put that historical inertia to rest. Well, let's dive in a little bit. Why are crowded screens bad? Why is uncluttered design a durable design principle? Well, because you don't really see everything on screens like this. Finding what you want takes time and attention and cognitive effort. You don't really see everything on the screen because of the way your eyes work. You probably didn't see, for example, who that screen was for, the demographic information in the upper left. It was for Sherlock Holmes, but you probably didn't notice that. And even fewer of you noticed that most of the screen, especially as you go over toward the right hand side, was just complete gibberish. Let's look at that screen again with a simulation of what you actually do see. I've written some programs that demonstrate certain design principles. Here's one that uses that crowded screen. The circle right there represents how much of the screen you really see at any one instance. The rest isn't really seen in any high detail. Your eye then darts that around to see different parts of the screen, guided by what you're working on right now. But as I mentioned, it's all really gibberish. What are raster possums? What are dimple plops? Here is the whole screen again. As you look at it, be conscious of the fact that your eyes dart around and at any point you only see a small amount. Find the part that says, oh my goodness, they're still cramming more stuff in here nobody needs. As a profession, we do an awful job of understanding users' jobs. So we don't know what to show them. We fall back to the option of showing them everything, often in data grids, because at least they can do their jobs that way. If we try to do better without understanding their jobs, we'll guess what they need to see at some point, and we'll usually guess wrong. And users have seen this problem before. They've learned to deal with crowded screens through a whole lot of practice. Crowded screens are not ideal, but they're a, they're a lot better than screens where they can't find what they want. They assume if you take away anything they need, that they will never find it. And they might be right based on their experience. The forefront of dealing with this problem is in mobile apps. The small screens there mean it's just impossible to show everything they want, even with crowding. So designers in that world have gone to design patterns like this one. This is the settings app on the iPhone. And man, are there a lot of settings there. And if I didn't have the capability to zero in on the setting that I wanted like this, most of those settings wouldn't, wouldn't really do me any good. So we've seen that pattern. In fact, Office did this in 2016. The ribbon in Office was introduced about 10 years before that. But I always had trouble finding the thing I wanted. Sometimes I had to go to Google to find out which of those tabs at the top it was on. Now I just put what I need in that little box that says, tell me what, what you want to do. And 95% of the time, it shows me what I need. Just to help convince you that users don't really see all the stuff that you think they do on the screen, let's take a little test. I'm gonna show three slides for about three seconds each. And each slide will contain drawings of common tools you might have around your house or workshop. And I want to give you a particular task. Of the three slides I will show, I want you to find out, even in the short amount of time that I show them, how many slides contain a hammer. And people don't really have any trouble with this, so don't get tensed up over it. You ready? Okay, how many hammers did you see? Well, probably two because the first and the third slide had a hammer and the middle one did not. And most of you got that with just, you know, just paying attention and watching the slides. 
But now, if I ask you completely different questions, such as how many pairs of pliers were there? Well, see, you don't know. How about scissors? How about wrenches, crescent wrenches? See, you aren't primed to look for those things, so you didn't really see them. Remember the screen with the little circle showing Sherlock Holmes and the rest of it kind of blurred out. Again, remember that simulation that when you look at screens like these, what you, you don't really see the whole thing. You see the part that you're interested in. Your brain tells you, oh, I care about hammers. And you look at the hammer and the rest of it is just filled in with a convincing fake. That little three slide test shows a couple of durable design principles. Uh, one is called inattentional blindness, which is the tendency that I talked about to filter out things that are considered irrelevant. It's convenient to give it a name in the design world so that we can talk about it among design teams and such with a common vocabulary. So we'll, we'll see a little bit of detail on inattentional blindness here in just a moment. Another principle that shows up is priming. You were told what to look for, so that's what you saw. Uh, we'll look briefly at some other principles based on the visual system, but first let's drill down a bit on inattentional blindness and also show another example of priming. Inattentional blindness comes from the way the retina is put together. As, as many design principles do, it's based on the science. If you ever heard the, the term phobia, you ever ran across that in biology. That's the part of the retina that sees high resolution, and it isn't very big. Uh, if you hold a pound coin or a quarter, a U.S. quarter at arm's length, or the, the full moon overhead on, on, a, on a dark night, then that's about the size of high resolution that you have. That's all. The rest of it, as we saw in my simulation, is filled in with kind of a convincing fake. Your tendency then is to use that small part of high resolution to focus on what it is you need to do and, and move that little area to things that seem to fit what you need to do. And anything that your brain doesn't consider relevant is just filtered out. There's a great demonstration of that that you can use to show your friends, and I'll put up the link here. It's a video. You should go watch it first. But then when you show it to your to your friends, make sure you don't tip them off. But the, the the phenomenon of inattentional blindness is demonstrated in this video in, in a convincing way that people understand then a little bit better about how their visual system works and have a little bit more respect for the fact that users don't actually see all of what's going on in a complex visual field. Now let's talk a bit more about priming, this idea that what you see is influenced by what you expect to see. And I'm going to do it by telling you a story about a, a real incident that happened to me. This is a picture uh, next to an elevator in a parking garage in St. Paul, Minnesota. I was out on a walk and the way the hills work there, I walked down a hill and decided to use the elevator in the parking garage to go back up to the level that I needed to be. So I walked into the parking garage looking for the elevator, and this is what I saw as I walked up to it. Now, if you're going to a parking garage elevator, an elevator that's on the bottom floor, it only goes one direction. So how many buttons do you expect to see? Well, you expect to see one. What shape would you expect that button to be? Well, round. Elevator buttons are, are most commonly round. So I walked right up to this box, saw the round thing right there, and pressed it. And what I got was the security guy coming on asking me if there was anything wrong. And by his bored tone, you can kind of tell he gets this about a dozen times a day. So why did I make that mistake? Well, we've already seen your visual system doesn't really look at things, it, it it look at everything. It zeroes in on the things it thinks were important. The part of my brain occupied with navigation at that point saw this thing and it fit the idea of the elevator button that I need. And I just kind of filtered the rest out and walked up and pressed it. Then of course, I pulled back to see that it's actually more like this. There is an elevator button there kind of low contrast, but 
but it is there. It just so happened that the angle that I came from, that the, the, the little round thing that was for the security guard was more easily visible. And so I just I just gravitated to that because, as I said, we, I don't see everything. My mind was engaged thinking about some other things. I had a presentation to give. So, of course, you know, my, my brain's churning on that. So that. And that, by the way, is another another point to keep in mind, a durable design principle that I didn't actually get into this session, that you have to expect that some percentage of your users will be distracted because life is complex. You should never assume that they are just focused only on what you need them to be focused on. Now, understanding these principles about priming and about inattentional blindness kind of helps us then imagine what some potential uh, things to do to, to prevent this mistake might be. For example, if we painted the round button red, well, elevator buttons aren't normally red. Red kind of tells you maybe you shouldn't press this. So that would tend to discourage. Or maybe you could put a plastic cover over the top that, that sort of flipped up, that you had to flip up the cover to press. Both of those things, either of those things or both, would tip off that part of your brain that's kind of on autopilot to say, oh no, no, this is not an elevator button. The priming to look for an elevator button would not be enough to overcome the variations from an elevator button. And then your attention span would almost certainly shift to the actual elevator button there to the left. Next, let me show you a software equivalent of this. I really believe in looking at design in the real world, but it certainly is helpful to be able to apply it in your life. This is the screen to log into the internet in a hotel that I happened to be in, in the Philadelphia area several years back. And I, I just go right there and click because that looks like the button, doesn't it? High speed internet, that's what I want. So click on it, it's free. Well, I actually don't get anything. The click didn't do anything. And it turned out that the reason why, as I scroll down to, to see the rest of the screen, was that the button is actually right down here. That meant that they were making something that was not a button look like a button. That's generally a bad idea for design because again, people are primed to look for certain things to accomplish their task. And if you disguise something else effectively as the thing they're looking for and they go for that, then you cause frustration and you waste their time. Here's another example that I ran across just last month on the FedEx website. FedEx is a giant company. It operates all over the world. And you would think that they wouldn't make really simple UX mistakes, but in fact, they do. So I went there, I had a tracking number trying to find out where my package was. And I see enter a FedEx tracking door tag or office number, this thing right here. Uh, and that thing looks like a text box. It looks like something that you would enter information in, but in fact, it's not. It's a label with a, an outline around it to draw attention to it. But again, that makes it look like something that it's not. Where I actually needed to put in the tracking number was here. Notice, by the way, that this is kind of gray. This isn't the, the, the contrast between the letters and the background here is not that great. That's the main thing that you need on this screen. That's the first thing that you need to put in. And yet the cosmetics don't really make it particularly easy to see. I was clicking in this thing right here, trying to get it to you know put a little cursor in there so I could enter my tracking number. And I felt a little bit silly when I realized, no, the tracking ID goes down here. Even I still look at bad design and sometimes feel silly. When you do that, don't blame yourself. It's not, it's not, there's nothing wrong with you. You're just a human being and your eyes and your brain work a certain way. It's the fault of the designer that did not take that into account. And finally, one more example. This was the American Airlines website a few years back, and I was getting a trip to a place in Texas, and I filled out several screens. This is the fourth screen in the process of picking out a flight and paying for it. And all the other screens, all three screens, had something down in this corner that was basically the continue button. Let's go to the next step. 
So I kind of got in the habit of doing that and I, I filled out this screen. There's a lot of stuff at the top that I filled out and I just scroll down to the bottom and hit this button right here without even looking at it, without even reading the label on it. It's like that. That's where the continue button is. So of course I'm going to press that. But notice what it really says is start over. It turns out that if you have not yet put in your payment method, the, there is no continue button. And they decided for, I guess, stylistic reasons that they were going to make everything aligned to the right. So instead of putting a blank space there or a disabled button there, they moved the start over button into the place that the continue button was on all the other screens. I'm telling you right now, they were losing money every day that this design was in place. They have replaced it about 18 months ago. They replaced it with a better design, but it just astounds me that such a major company would make that kind of mistake. Now, when you did put in the credit card information, you got something that looked like it really should have looked like all along that if you if you press the pay button and you hadn't put it in yet, it should give you an error that you haven't put in your credit card information or something. It shouldn't throw away all the information you just spent several minutes constructing about which flights you wanted and, and exactly what time that you needed them and so forth. So the durable design principle we take from this, don't fool your users, don't violate their expectations, don't make things look like something that they're not. There's a design principle reference name for this. It's called archetypes, expected forms, things that look like people expect them to because they're so commonly used or culturally expected. Also, don't establish a pattern of interaction and then violate it for no reason. That inconsistency will confuse people. So remember what your user's expectations are and do your best to satisfy them. There are other durable design principles that are based in the human visual system. Let me show you one based on a sign and a mistake that I made when I got off a hotel elevator and saw this. I'm in room 207. I see the range 201 to 223 and see the arrow relatively close below that. So I take off toward the left and I discover I'm going the wrong way. And when I go back, I see that in fact, those arrows are higher than they should be they should be closer to the numbers that they represent. This is just very poor design of the sign that encourages people to make mistakes. And the underlying design principle is called gestalt proximity. The mind, the eye naturally assumes that things that are close together are related in some fashion. My eye and mind decided that that arrow and those numbers were related because of their proximity to one another. Here's an example from software. If I look at this Amazon product page, I was actually on this page looking at products and decided that I like this, this uh, USB thing here. And I went down through the information about it and checked the checkbox that's below it. But in fact, that's not the correct checkbox for that product. The correct checkbox is up here. It's further away. So again, we see that the principle of proximity said that the eye naturally assumed that it was this one when it was not. So the durable design principle for gestalt proximity is that you should group naturally related things together and leave some space around them. And in particular, try to avoid grouping things or putting things close to something else when they don't really have any relationship. Again, that design principle is called gestalt proximity. The visual system assumes things close together are related some way, and that's automatic and unconscious. It's not something that you consciously have to think about. It happens in a small fraction of a second automatically. It's so that we can sense our environment very quickly for survival purposes. We can apply this in various ways in software. For example, notice that on the, the left, we have a typical templated list of information. This happens to be customer interactions. Well, that's one way of presenting the information, and that would be probably the easiest to, to do from a software perspective. But suppose we put it on a timeline. In that case, this same data is placed on a timeline so that those customer interactions that are close together in time are grouped, and that helps people understand that they probably have some relationship with one another. So for example, 
uh, a service call and the related payment might be grouped close together. So timelines help you group things by time, whereas templated lists do not. So it's not just that we don't want to make mistakes by violating uh, Gestalt proximity. We can actually use it to improve our designs. A related principle is called Gestalt similarity, whereas proximity says that the mind, the eye groups things by how close they are together. Gestalt similarity says that the mind groups things based on how alike they are in terms of color or shape or size. So we can see Gestalt proximity working here. We normally would, when we look at this, our eye tends to think that these are columns of stars and not rows, just based on the spacing and the Gestalt proximity underlying it. But if we change the colors like this, now the eye tends to perceive rows instead of columns because similarity by color is actually a little bit stronger than Gestalt proximity. Similarity of shape works similarly. We tend to see rows in this particular situation. And when we see these Gestalt principles applied, they can also be used to make things stand out. When everything is similar, then the, the thing that's not like the others tends to be found very quickly by the visual system. So for example, telling you to find the triangle, you don't have to scan around for it, you see it instantly. Looking for the green star, no problem. It pops up, your visual system finds it right away because it's programmed to notice things that break the pattern. That automatic way that the visual system just finds shapes and colors leads to another durable design principle, which is that shape and color signal information much better than text. At this point, you've kind of seen in your mind how proximity and similarity work quickly and unconsciously in your visual system. And the visual system does other things automatically too. So shape and color are normally better ways to convey information than by reading text. And we're gonna see some examples of that here in a moment from a real application. Reading just takes a lot more effort. But reading also has another problem, which is it can be made worse by the use of jargon. Let's see an example here. So this might be, this is a spoofed dialogue. I just made it up, but it gives you the idea of something that, that a developer might put into an application. The OAuth token is not valid. It may be stale or corrupted. Do you want to override default security protocol, protocols, et cetera, et cetera? Well, that is not the sort of thing that a typical user is really going to get much meaning out of when they read it. They are more likely to interpret that as something like this unnecessary click required. The ice cracking is not solid. It may be stalled or called Raptor. Do you want to go ahead and do what you want it to do? See, remember that people are focused on their tasks and what you've done with all that jargon is to put an artificial blockage in the way of what it is they're trying to do. You haven't really explained in any significant way why they ought to check one or the other. So they're going to default to clicking the thing that lets them go on to, 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 to accomplish their their job. Always remember as you do design, these people have jobs to do. They're not usually concerned with internal technical stuff. They barely read what you wrote and they don't know the jargon. So that's just that, that they tend to ignore it and just take the, the quickest shortcut they can to getting on with what they need to do. So how do we use color and shape to make things better in the UX? Well, some of the general guidelines are the things that are big and colorful in the foreground are going to be more noticed than small, less colorful background. And I've seen, we've already seen a couple of examples where um, things weren't big and colorful in the foreground, even though people needed to use them. The FedEx screen was an example. So keep that in mind. If, if you need to draw attention to something, color can be used to do that. On the other hand, if, if you put too much color, if you jam too much color into a particular view, then now people kind of get lost in the complexity. Uh, also, shapes should be relevant and evocative. They should be something that calls to mind in the mind of the user what the shape is trying to communicate. Let's, uh, let's show an example here. Let me turn my laser printer on, laser pointer on so that I can go through some of this. This is a screen from an actual application that we worked on in a recent project. This software manages the delivery and billing for fuel products. 
such as kerosene and propane. Now first notice that the overall theme is subtle and it uses neutral colors and that allows colors to stand out when they communicate something important such as the COD up here in the upper left. In America, COD stands for collect on delivery. Uh, it's used for customers that don't pay their bills reliably. And if you're a small business person, that's something you really care about. You, want to, you don't want to be sending off valuable fuel to somebody who you realize from past experience probably isn't going to pay for it. Uh, second, there's a bar of data up here and that tends to have that we designed that to have the most important information we thought somebody would need to look at when they looked at a particular customer who, who got fuel deliveries. Uh, for example, there's 17 days since the last delivery. It's important to know how long it's been uh, since they got a delivery um, and how much do they owe you and are they happy? There's a little smiley face sort of icon there that demonstrates whether or not you're on good terms with them. And next, you want to notice the shapes that look like fuel tanks They're right here, there and there. Both the shape of the tank and the color inside it help the user understand what kind of fuel tank it is. Propane is a yellowish green color and the propane tank looks like a big pill. Uh, kerosene tanks have flatter ends and kerosene in the US is dyed with a particular shade of red. So people in the fuel industry will very quickly pick up on these signals. It's much faster for them to take in information this way than if it, than it would be if it were just text. I mean, we could put labels that say this is propane and this is kerosene, but it would take additional cognitive effort for people to figure that out. Color and shape communicate more quickly than text. Finally, notice the background shapes that are in the card views in the bottom row there and there. Uh, those cards show recent interactions with the customer. If you just scan that and you were looking for a service call, which one would you quickly guess that would be? Well, a quick scan, visual scan, would pick up that wrench right there that's in the background. Now that wrench is, is, is rendered in such a way that it doesn't really disturb the reading of the text that's in front of it. But if you're scanning the entire row, your eye naturally interprets that to, to have some meaning. And the meaning, of course, of a wrench would typically be service call. So the visual system is doing the work for you. Again, I could put a label that says it's a service call, but that doesn't come to mind as quickly. It doesn't help the user find via a quick scan as quickly as using that shape. And so to summarize the effective use of color, uh, your overall thing should be subtle so that when you're using color for signaling, that's easy for the eye to pick out. Don't make your color in general too bright, even for signaling. Too bright colors are tiring. Uh, so if, if you use more of muted reds and muted greens to signal uh, bad and good, then you, that makes the interface easier to use over, over the long term. Use gradients. We talked about that earlier. Gradients should be subtle and they should promote a natural feel in the UI. There are some cultural things to be concerned with. For example, in China, good is signaled with red, whereas in most uh, uh, Anglophile cultures, then red is associated with warnings, with bad. Um, and don't be afraid to delegate to visual design specialists when you can get away with that because they do specialize in a lot of these things. They're probably better at picking out color and such than you are, and they're probably somewhat better at layout than you are. And while finding interaction design specialists that really understand the domain and create software that will that will make it the, the, the user feel like it's easy to use, those that kind of expertise is not easy to come by. But Visual design isn't that hard to find. We've we've created a whole crop of people uh, for web visual design in the last uh, five to ten years. So leverage that expertise when you need to. Here's another uh, durable design principle. If you wonder why in iOS and and very sort of 
the platforms that are thought of as using design effectively, that they use a lot of rounded boxes and such. There's actually a design principle around that. And it's one of these things that's kind of built into the human brain. Smooth objects tend to be perceived as safe and sharp objects tend to be perceived as dangerous. And of course, that comes very naturally from the real world. The fact that, um, that sharp objects in the real world are dangerous. That's where the English word edgy comes from. Now, as usual, when we have these durable design principles, they normally have a name to refer to them. And in this case, the name is contour bias, if you look at reference books on design. And this, you know, you hear me say this and go, yeah, yeah, so what? Smooth objects, who cares? Well, you can signal safety or danger using this. It's more powerful than you might, you might realize. It's more powerful than words, in fact. And I'll prove that to you. Let me show you one particular sentiment you might send on Valentine's Day to someone that was important to you. Uh, and then let's take that same phrase and keep the exact same words, but we're going to change the shape of the letters, the kind of font to something more sharp edged and change out the shape to something kind of sharp. And then we get this. Now, you see, that conveys a completely different meaning to somebody reading it. And all we did was change it from smooth to sharp. But it's not just the visual system and the cognitive system that give us some of these dual design principles. Some of them are based on psychology. And there are some practices that tend to work in the design world and practices that don't. So we're going to go through this list, starting with the idea of transparent design. I also want to talk some about how aesthetics fit in design, the importance of centering design on the user, and how we work iteration into our design. So a durable design principle is that good design is transparent. And this is one of the things that turns out to be very a very easy mistake to make, um, because when developers first get involved in design, they tend to want to be very clear and obvious about it. They tend to want their designs stand out and be somewhat flashy. Uh, but but see, users, the, the best designs aren't even really noticed by users. They just use the designs and the designs fit what they want to do. In my experience, any design that tries to draw attention to itself, wave, waving a flag saying, eh, what a good design I am. Well, that's that is not is almost always suboptimal design. And the worst example I know of is Windows 8. Understand that Windows 8 was created in a time when Microsoft was just kind of learning some of this stuff. And so they made bright, flashy colors, colors that didn't really have any meaning for the, the circumstances. Uh, they made everything very sharp edges. They didn't they didn't try to, to take advantage of that contour bias to make things feel calm. And basically what the design was doing was kind of waving the flag. As I said, look at me, I'm a cool design. Uh, and that that is almost always a bad design. I've never really seen that kind of thing be uh, uh, work very well. The first time I saw one design, I immediately felt it would probably fail because it it's, was simply not well designed. This was one situation, one, one part of the bad design, but there were actually quite a number of them. It has many design flaws, but this, the bright colors and sharp edges, look at me, I'm cool. See, contrast that with much of the design of iOS. You don't really think much about that design. You just use it. So you need to be careful to resist the temptation to make designs flashy. What, you, what you're looking for is if you come up with a new design, either on paper or prototype or whatever, and you put it in front of the user and they sort of go, oh yeah, of course, that the design you put in front of them fits what how they think things should work so well that it's just natural. That's what you want. You don't want them going, oh, that's a great design. You're probably never going to get that. And you don't want to try to force it by trying to make things flashy or cool. In fact, when I teach design classes, and I have classes that go uh, anywhere from two days up to five days and to, to help a team master uh, design principles and process. When I teach that class, one of the things I emphasize is that one of the most dangerous phrases in the world of software development is, wouldn't it be cool if? 
you're not trying to make your software cool for the most part, unless you're doing games or some things like that. For typical business software, cool for you does not mean cool for users. It should be transparent. And even the aesthetics, good aesthetics are not flashy. They're subtle. They feel good, but they don't wave some flag talking about how, 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 how beautiful they are. And that leads to the durable design principle that aesthetics do matter, but there are other design aspects that matter even more. You see, there's this misperception that I, I see a lot among developers and managers on teams that have never really embraced design. They have this idea that design equals aesthetics, that aesthetics is practically all of design. I get somebody that call me about, oh, I don't know, maybe once, a, once every two or three months and they say, something like well we're almost finished with this project and we need you to put a good design on it now what they mean is they want me to make it pretty they don't want me to design it they want me to decorate it and what they're really not getting is that pretty doesn't make it easier to use or comprehensible now nobody wants an ugly design that's certainly true and some level of good aesthetics helps people understand that you have a quality product, but aesthetics alone just won't do it. Here's an example of a website to kind of show what I mean. This is the myalcon.com. I was going there looking for some, uh, some, some specific eye drops that they make. And you can see a little video of this website in operation. If you'd like, there's the, 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 bit.ly link that I put up that links to a video on my website. It's, I don't know, two or three minutes that goes through some of the major things I think is wrong. Notice that overall, the aesthetics on this site look just fine. They're, they are using layering and translucency. They've got this nice curve thing over here instead of a normal menu to go to the various sections you might want to go to. Uh, so from a pure cosmetic standpoint, well, they obviously spent a lot of time and money on their aesthetics. But I found this site frustrating to use. It's hard to click on products for information. There's a lot of gratuitous, annoying animation. And you can go see the video if you'd like to see some of that, if you're, if you're interested in diving in that a little bit deeper to see an example of a site for which the aesthetics are fine, but the interaction is not. And that really ruins the user experience on the site. So let's summarize some of the ways I think you ought to think about aesthetics and be able to strike the right balance. First, you want a basic level of aesthetics that makes the application look like a modern application. Something that's in Battleship Gray says, you know, this was made in the 1990s and you don't want that. You want subtle theming. You want open, uncluttered design. And because that's that's what people expect now, the, the, the uh, our technologies have made it so we can bring in things as we need them. So it's a lot easier to have open designs. Uh, and if you're doing commercial software, if you're doing uh, packages or software as a service, now you need more investment in aesthetics. And as I talked about earlier, you might want to get some some visual design help for something. So you do want that basic level that tells the user that you are creating a modern, fresh app. In, in essence, the aesthetics becomes a proxy for quality of design. People see the aesthetics and go, oh, these people know what they're doing. Get that visual design help if you need it. But normally, from a developer's perspective, you want aesthetics to be a lower priority than interaction and usefulness. Interaction and usefulness are about the user, and that leads to the idea that one of the most durable principles that I can tell you about today is that your UX design should be user-centered not technology centered, not process centered, not convention centered. You want UX designs that that benefit the users, that make them more productive and help them avoid errors and help them be familiar with the software more quickly. Those those are your priorities. And the only way you get that is to really understand those users. The first step in understanding them is to observe them in their natural work environment. 
so that you understand their job at a little more than uh, uh, the level you might get off of a piece of paper. And you use those observations to map out the user's task flows and the pain points. Those task flows will then map into particular flows within your software. Pain points indicate areas where you need to put a little extra effort in designing something that helps the user overcome those pain points. And typically, almost all good design is done by sketching some ideas for new designs and then incorporating feedback from your users and your stakeholders. When you do that, you're much more likely to arrive on a good design. Now, let me let me pull back just a second and talk about something here that is uh, just almost a curse on this industry. And that is that there are many developers who feel, I don't know, maybe that it's not their job to sketch out design and figure it out, that they will tell you, well, the way to get a good design or to way to get any functional design is just to throw something on the screen and then show that to users, not to sketch first. And in general, what they're saying is that they don't really know how to listen to users and how to go to translate what the users tell them into interesting design ideas. It's a skill set that they don't have. So they kind of implicitly believe they don't they can't develop that skill set and you shouldn't feel that way because most developers can they can, you, you look you don't have to be an artist just sketch things out and show them to the users and get an idea of whether or not uh, that's going to suit their needs you'll also get better results if you collaborate both with users and with other people on your team collaboration tends to produce quite a, a lot more ideas and the more ideas you produce the more likely you are to come up with some really good ones and finally, you do want to iterate uh, through through the design process because the first idea you come up with will probably not be your best. And I, I will talk about that a bit more here in a minute. But first, I do want to emphasize when it comes to user-centered design, what you're trying to do, as in so many things in life, it's a balance. Usefulness combines both utility, that is that the product does what it needs to do, the app does what it needs to do, and usability, that the, it's approachable and the users are able to figure out how to do what it will do for their own jobs. That little equation there is, is uh, was first I heard it was from a, a very well-known designer named Jakob Nielsen, uh, who is part of the Nielsen Norman uh, Design Usability Consulting Group. So. Keep that firmly in mind. Your design should do what the user needs, but by itself, that's not that's not enough. The design should also be understandable and usable. When you put both of those together, now you've got useful software. Let's go on and talk a bit more about the the role of iteration in design. As I mentioned earlier, the first idea you come up with for a design. Uh, is very, very unlikely to be perfect. It might not even be good. It might just be the launch pad that gets you to something that 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 is is workable. So there are several places that you do an iterative cycle during design. The first one is typically done during that sketching phase. A lot of designers would call that ideation. You sketch out new ideas, you refine them, you get some feedback, and then you do some more sketching and you go through several cycles of that, several iterative cycles. There's another set of cycles, set of iterations during prototyping that you actually take that stuff that's on paper and flesh it out into wireframes or actual interactive prototypes or something so that you get to see a more high fidelity version of the design and certain certain weaknesses of the design will come out at that point. So you have to go through iterations to fix those problems. And even when the designs hit production, the iteration can continue. You may come up with a better idea, but what's more common is that there are changing conditions. Something about the job changes, something about the information changes, and you have to do an iteration on design to address those changes. I do want to caution you about something about iteration, though, because you will find folks in the industry, they are 
advocates of methodologies that talk about minimum viable product and things like that. And I've had discussions with some of these people and they, their attitude is we're gonna throw something on the screen that's the minimum amount of features that people need and we'll iterate that to get a better user experience. I'm sorry, but I think those people are just out in the weeds. Don't rush to production with a poorly thought out design. Yeah, you probably want your minimum viable feature set. You want to know what that is in order to go do do the, the first version of the product, but you should design around that feature set because I have never seen somebody put out a bad design and then iterate that to a good design. Instead, you need to understand what your features and capabilities are, design to that, come up with a decent design, and iterate that to something e even better. So do your iteration as much as possible during the design process. You don't want to be iterating once the software is, is, is in production at the same level. As I mentioned earlier, you will do some iteration while once you get into production, but in general, you're just making it better at that point the majority of the iteration and development should be during the design process before you get into serious laying down of code. Let's finish up by taking a look at some resources that you might find effective if you want to go from this and go a little bit deeper into some of these areas. There is a, uh, a set of design books. I, I created a web page for this. Let's see if I can't bring this up. There it is. These are some design books that I recommend. Uh, this one right here at the very beginning, Universal Principles of Design, is a good starting point because it goes through 125 of those design principles, not all of which apply to software, but many of them do. And it, it summarizes them very concisely and gives you a pretty good idea. That That's the book that you use to build a good working vocabulary for operating in the design space. Some of the other books, I mentioned Nielsen Norman, there's Don Norman's, uh, one of the first books, popular books, really written on design, the design of everyday things. Um, if you were interested in the design process, how you kind of go through that sketching and, and, and ideation and iteration that I talked about, sketching user experiences is a good book for that. Um, and there's this book also has a lot of methods that you can think about using during design to get ideas and help manage those ideas. And some of the things on, for example, the proximity, the, the Gestalt proximity, that was taken from this book, Designing with the Mind in Mind. So if you're really interested in how the visual system affects software design, that's a good book to take a look at. Now, in addition to that, we've got the ROI estimator. This basically is something to help get people to understand that you've got um, reasons to use to, to invest in design that it usually pays you back. I created a spreadsheet with some formulas in it that says, well, if we've got this many users and they use the app this many hours a day and their total cost, including, you know, their their salary and their benefits and their computer and everything you spend on them is this much and you include you increase their productivity this much then here's what you're going to get out of that in terms of extra money so as you can see if we were to say okay well yeah in this particular instance we're really only looking at uh 70 000 as the number let's put that in 70 then it reduces the amount proportionally. So that actually is a formula there. There's also savings from errors and savings from reduced training. So if, if you're interested in helping some of the people inside your organization understand why you might want to do design, this is, is a good uh, place to go for that. I have a white paper on navigation patterns you might find interesting to get some ideas about how to, how to build the navigation of an app. And if you work on desktop apps, you probably need something that helps the application get booted up and get started and check security and manage all the views and things like that. I have a white paper on how you build one of those, particularly in, in native technologies like XAML. I have some video courses. Um, 
I have a four and a half hour plural site course on design principles. You'll see some of the same stuff here with quite a bit more depth. I also have a, a, a shorter course, about two hours, on UX design for developers that covers some basic principles and process, and that's on LinkedIn Learning. And finally, if you have to interview developers, I have a course on that. Let me just make it obvious if it isn't, I am available for consulting, although, yeah, I, I'm a little bit on the expensive side, but my team both does UX design and development of native apps. So if you happen to be in a situation where our services might be of interest to you, then, then you should contact me. I've got a lot of, a lot of contact information there. Uh, I do on-site training for teams on UX design. I mentioned my course earlier. Haven't done any this year because of the virus, but I hope to get back to that next year. So please contact me with questions or inquiries about what I might be able to do. I hope this I hope this has really been a session that has been of value to you in as a way to bootstrap you into some of these things in design from a developer's point of view. Thanks for watching.